Welcome everybody to a, another episode of Jaws Diet um, by Jennifer A. Whitaker. Um, uh, the the show is a part of the World of Ability Podcast Network, and uh, special thanks to Marcus, Jay, Zach, and Lawrence for allowing us to have this on their platform. Encourage everybody to check out all of our social media, and I'm going to pass it over to Jen to get us started. Thank you, Emily, and welcome, everybody. Thank you for tuning in or watching this at a later time when it's convenient for you. Uh, for those of you who may not have seen this before, the Jaws diet is a healthy eating diet that is... Um, Gluten-free, soy-free, egg-free, and dairy-free. Uh, I personally designed this because of having all, all four allergens myself. So I've had to find ways to eat healthy and, and at the same time stay free of those four allergens. So in this show, we each episode introduce you to a different uh, foods that are made free of those four allergens. And some of them, like, like the Made Good brand we showed you in one of our recent episodes, actually has more than just the healthy bars that we told you about. And uh, so if you haven't checked out some of our prior episodes, please be sure to do so because all the different items we have mentioned in our episodes even if it's stuff already made, like, like the nutritious bars of uh, the no cow brand and the made good bars and so forth, it's all allergen free. And some of it's free of more than just our four allergens. That said, today we're going to uh, possibly have somebody join in. But for now, I'm going to get you started on today's recipe. For many of us, we like, um, especially those of us from the South, we love coleslaw. However, mayo alone, or mayonnaise, whichever you use, has uh, at least egg, if not milk in it. That said, I'm going to show you a healthy alternative to coleslaw. Coleslaw is based on using shredded cabbage. However, cabbage is considered a carbohydrate. So today I'm going to talk to you about using well So today I'm going to talk to you about using, oops, it's still blurry. Broccoli slaw. This is kind of like coleslaw as far as it's, you may, you see different shreds of vegetables, but in this case, it's broccoli based. So you're you're basically finding a more traditional way via coleslaw in this case of eating broccoli. That as traditional as it is to eat coleslaw, a lot of us don't have any problems eating it as long as it's allergen free. And looking on the back. The broccoli alone has 7% um, fiber, zero added sugar, two grams of protein, 4% of calcium, 4% of iron, 6% of potassium, only 1% of sodium, zero cholesterol, and zero fat. While one cup of this law has 
only 25 calories. Okay, so then you're asking me, how do you make broccoli slaw into coleslaw? Well, going back to the mayonnaise problem, I found Hellman's vegan, they call it dressing and spread, but it's basically mayo made plant-based. So it's basically mayonnaise in the, by Hellman's that's vegan, or in other words, free of gluten, soy, milk, and egg. Uh, and this is what I use as my my mayo based uh, substitute. And then after you have mixed, I say about uh, two um, tablespoons, um, not smooth, but like. Um, lumps, big spoonful lumps of mayo. In this vegan, this vegan dressing spread into this broccoli slaw that's in a um, some kind of bowl of some sort for mixing. Then add, I would say, at least three stevias. Three after these little packs to your mix, and you can um, accommodate it by adding more of the vegan dressing and spread, and or more of the um, stevia as you find need, so you can adjust it to your own taste and preference. However, those are the basic ingredients to make making what's broccoli based so it's high fiber and healthy as opposed to carb based which is using regular coleslaw or um, cabbage based vegetable and still being free of gluten, soy, milk, and egg. Any questions, anybody? Kurt, are you still here? Kurt, are you still here? Emily, are you with me? Uh, yep, and then we have, we have, now we have Beth Shapiro on, on here, too. Really? I don't see her. Yeah, she's on Zoom. Oh. Would you put her in here, then? Uh, I can't have to give her the link and everything, then. Oh wait, she's the one expecting. That's what I do. That. That's what it is. But she just came in, so she didn't hear anything of what you said. Sure, I'll I'll let her know what I just introduced. All right, hi Beth. We are doing a uh, podcast right now with Jennifer A. Whitaker. Beth? Yep. We are doing a podcast right now. But, Jen, do you have anything you want to introduce yourself? Anything like that? Yeah, well, can you put her on StreamYard so we can see her and see who we're talking to? I, I can't do that, Jen. So she's on Zoom and we're on stream. She's on Zoom and you're on StreamYard. 
So that means I have to give her the link and I don't know. We'll see if she can get in. Um, okay. I had to do it on my phone. Yes, um, go to the link that's at the top of the. I couldn't get like, the, the link. Wait, wait. But I, I couldn't get the link to work on the computer. Oh, you didn't, you didn't download, you weren't able to download it? You weren't able to download it, Club Deck? Yes, I was able to download it, but I can't connect to you, Zoom, on the computer. Uh, you go to the same link, you, it's the oh, same way you Oh, she's on, she's on Clubhouse it. then. Yeah, I don't know yeah. wrong. I'll just use whatever is left in my phone battery. Oh. She's actually not on Clubhouse right now, Jen. She's on Zoom. The ability now Zoom. Okay. So what I was just introducing, um, you said is Miss Beth. Is that the right name? Beth, yes. Yep. Okay, so um, th I was telling all of our listeners about a um, healthy alternative to coleslaw because the Jones diet is basically a uh, what many doctors say is very nutritious and healthy way of eating that's free of gluten, soy, milk, and egg which are my personal four allergens. And so a lot of people just want to develop this show. Well, what in the world do you eat? <laughs> so I was telling listeners, I don't know if you can, can you see me? No, she cannot see you. Because you're in two separate, uh, Ms. Beth, can two you separate see me? things. Oh, okay. No, she cannot see you. Okay. So um, what I was telling our listeners. Thank you, Emily. Uh, what I was telling our listeners about Miss Beth is Hellman's vegan dressing and spread, which is like mayo, but it's vegan, so it does not have egg or milk, which are the uh, two main allergens in mayo or mayonnaise. And um, this was called broccoli slaw, which are shredded pieces of broccoli that you can use. And I was telling my uh, listeners about using to make basically coleslaw, but it's broccoli based instead of cabbage. So you've got a fiber uh, as opposed to like a um, green vegetable to a carbohydrate as your base. And then using uh, stevia as a healthier alternative to it. So would you tell us? That makes sense. That makes sense because what I what you um, do and what you have to add about healthy eating. Yeah, um, I know you were talking about not using milk, but I digest grass milk better than I do grain milk. So it makes sense what you're saying. Well, we're talking about those that have allergies. So it's if it's an allergy, they can't have it at all. Oh, okay, I see what you mean. Yeah, I have I have allergies to some foods. Yeah, because that's why I started off with how how this is a diet free of the four major allergens, gluten, soy, dairy, and egg, because I personally, those are my allergens, so I can't have them. It's not a matter of the preference. It's a matter of my body cannot digest it without having some kind of serious reaction. The whole reason for a show is that a lot of people ask me, well, what in the world do you eat? So that's exactly what the show is about, the stuff that I do eat that's allergen-free, but it's also a healthy diet. Does that help clarify? Yeah, 
Yeah, no, I understand. I have allergies to food too. Just not milk. Oh, I thought you were saying that you do consume milk. Is milk one of your allergens? No, she has, Jen, she said she has allergies to other foods, but not, milk is not one of them. Well, I was saying that we do gluten, soy, milk, and egg avoidance. So what? Yeah, she said she, allergens, Jen, she says she has food allergies too, but uh, milk is not one of, or your dairy is not one of them. One of her allergies. Right. So I just asked her, what are her, her allergens? So Beth, what kind of uh, foods are you allergic to? Um, corn, acids. I'm allergic to like turmeric, um, tannic, um, just all acids. And chemicals, chemicals in food, chemicals in the environment. Um, I'm allergic to yeast. And I could have some egg, because I, I have a hard time digesting eggs sometimes. But I, I can eat things on a rotation diet. Do you know what that means? And so I'm like allergic Did you say paleo diet or a keto diet? Rotation oh, tomatoes. Oh. So would you would you tell our listeners yeah, what rotation. are some of the now that we know your allergens, what are some healthy foods you recommend eating if they have any of your kind of allergies? Um flax or flax oil. Flaxseed, um, maca, um, let's see, oregano is very I know maca is often used to make, wait, go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say, no, maca is often used to make tea. What do you do with it? Um, sometimes you use it in smoothies, but I think there's other things you can do with it. Somebody who I found very helpful is somebody named Megan Tubner. She's out of Canada. And she has um, some good recipes, and she also sells some things. But she's, I don't know if she's a dietitian or a nutritionist, but she's really good. Yeah, when you, um, when you work with Emily and try to, try to um, contact her and get us in touch with her, she'd be another great person to add to the recommended health eating so what were some of your other ingredients that you fo focus on with your diet and some ideas of what to make out of them like how to use them Um, I put flax oil on yogurt. Well, I can eat dairy. Can Emily not eat dairy? So we avoid gluten, soy, milk, and egg. And milk is dairy. So in other words, yogurt and stuff like that, we cannot have on because of the, the allergens we focus on on this show. Okay. Can you have coconut? Yes, whether it's actual coconut fruit or it's dried coconut, like, you know, the snack that you get in the raisin aisle, or it's, um, say, coconut milk. 
like let's say as some of us would use coconut milk as the the uh, milk replacement for for say a coffee on a latte or something because yes that doesn't fall in dairy gluten soy or egg right um coconut dairy you could get some yogurt made with coconut and put some flax oil on it or some flax powder and that would be a really healthy way to get your EFAs, your essential fatty acids, which we need. You can also do it in smoothies. Um, you can also put it on your salad. It sounds kind of weird, but it has kind of a nutty taste. And so it's really good in salads. Do you mean the coconut milk or do you mean the, um, what sounds like a coconut milk based yogurt, which I was wondering if it's maybe the So Delicious or the Daya brand that you're talking about? Oh, of the I'm yogurt? sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry if that was confusing. Um, I meant the flax seed and the flax powder you can put in salad. They don't. Want to So personally, I really love um, salad when we have. Uh, with. Well, what was the that? coconut milk you could use in smoothie too. Yeah, that actually drinks right in. When you were talking about the. Um, um, the um, all the. Uh, when you were talking about the um the the seeds that you put on or the uh, coconut flakes or whatever that you're talking about putting on your salad i gotta say I, um that sounds pretty delicious because like i personally love to have uh roasted pine nuts on my salad it gives a crunch to the salad yeah, that's good too. That's really good. Do you like capers? Um, do you mean the kind of nut? I'm not sure what you're talking about. Well, caper isn't a nut, it's a flower. And you can use that in salad too. It's kind of salty. But it's good with fish. Flour? Fish. Flour, like, is it baking flour or what kind of flour? Capo. I'm not sure. I don't know, but it's just it. It looks like a ball, but it's a it's a type of flour. I I haven't researched it that much. But you, but does it like is it like are you saying how it's grown? Is a flour, but it's actually like a like this um brown thing we often see at uh. Um, buffets like salad buffets I really can't answer that I suppose we could google it <laughs> I can google it do you want me to do that sure and maybe read what you find that, that okay. describes what it okay. is because I wonder okay. how many of our listeners also are kind of wondering what exactly is that? Even though it may be a great idea, right? Okay, it says capers come from a prickly bush called Compare Spinosa that grows wild across the Mediterranean and parts of Asia. The capers we see in, let's see what else it says. If you've ever followed a chicken piccata recipe, you know that capers are indispensable for finishing the dish. 
Or maybe you recognize the name from the mysterious jars in the pickle aisle that contain these pea-sized green orbs. But what is a caper? Let's explore. The capers we see in the grocery store are the unripe, ripened green flower buds of the plant. Once they're picked, the immature buds are dried and then preserved. They can be cured either in salt or pickled in brine, which is what gives capers a trademark savory, briny flavor profile. The taste of caper is reminiscent of the lemony tang and brineness of green olives, but with a smack of floral tartness all their own. Because they're packed in brine, capers also boast a salty, savory flavor profile. So does that kind of give you an idea? They're used in Mediterranean cuisine, particularly in seafood dishes, such as baked fish and pasta sauces, such as pus canessa sauce. But they also add a briny, savory, lemony hit to all kinds of dishes like chicken piccata. They also provide a tangy counterpart to rich dishes such as hearty stews, lamb, and you don't want this, but or cheese. They are often served with appetizing spreads into garnish bagels, cream cheese, and again, you don't want that, and lox. They're finely chopped. They bring a bright briny backbone to tapenade. So we get an olive tapenade. Sauces, dressings, and compound butters. They can also be fried to create a crispy garnish. They come in different varieties according to size. They include non pareils which are about a fourth of an inch wide or seven millimeters in diameter and come from the south of France. You'll also see them labeled as French non pareils this is the smallest variety available. They tend to have a more concentrated flavor and delicate texture. As a result, they tend to be more prized and have a higher price tag to match. And it kind of goes on from there, but does that kind of give you an idea? Yeah. Uh, it, I'm starting to think I've seen them at um, East Cafe or something like that, or Cafe East. Do you know what chain I'm talking about? Or maybe that wasn't the name, but there's a um, there's a chain that this predominantly serves salads that I think I've seen it at. So, what are some other ideas you you have? Um, because um, I'm sure you've got um, some people looking up capers as a possible topping or cooking ingredient. Uh, to say add to their um, seasonings for baked meat or, or um, pan browned meat using olive oil instead of um, butter because of the allergens because you know butter has milk so and in some cases it also has soy or egg what depending upon the brand. Butter. What, what? What about safflower oil? Yeah. Safflower um, oil? So, so sunflower oil is great in replacement of butter. So is olive oil. oil um, I, I'm, I know the vegetable oil has uh, soy, so that's why I don't recommend it. Plus there's modern day research just finding that stuff like olive oil and like maybe like you're saying so our oil are better for our health than vegetable oil even for those of us that don't have the allergens um but to say that that you know they people could use this uh capers as a a topping on their bake their meat that they bake or that they pan brown using sunflower oil or olive oil as the basic replacement of butter um 
and then maybe was it um, Maka? Was that the other one? It might the other be good with brown thing? rice. Oh, you said Maka would be? That was kind of choppy. So was it Maka or what was the um, the earlier seasoning? And I asked about being a tea. Do you know what I'm talking about? Um. Yeah, I know about tea, but what about tea? I said, so was the other ingredient you talked about maca that I talked about being in tea? Was that called maca? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so so with this cooking, then people could also see in their meat, or like you said, the, the rice that they boil in a pot of water, so then it gets allergen free. Uh, with maca, like you said, the rice would be great with maca on it, and then uh, the the grilled, pan browned or baked meat would be great with um, the uh, ca um, capers as a seasoning. Yeah, that might be interesting. Um, garlic would be good. Um, oregano would be good. Maybe like a spicy seasoning, not too spicy, but it could be Cajun or it could be just a little bit Cajun. Um, you say Cajun, I think of cayenne pepper. <laughs> What's that? When you say Cajun, I think of cayenne pepper. Yeah, I was trying to think of um, people from Louisiana. What do they call it? Um, Ellen? Peter, um, maybe? I know Louisiana. Uh, the end of they eat alligator and um, they also eat frog legs. No, 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 no. I'm trying to think. What is the? What are their people called? Um, there's a spice like that. Um, huh? I just know them as Cajuns, but I'm next door in Texas. <laughs> oh, Cajun, yeah, Cajun spices. Cajun spices would be good. But maybe even Chinese spices would be good. Well, like Chinese spices are not necessarily because Chinese often cook with soy. And then again, that's one of our allergens we have to avoid. No, no, no. But this, the spices don't use soy. It's like ginger and other stuff. It's oh, so soy. you're saying there's soy, the soy from Cajun food mainly comes from soy, um, soy sauce, right? Right, I'm not talking about soy sauce. I'm talking about the spices, something you sprinkle on. That's right, but I didn't realize that the spices were were soy free because there's usually like so excess like excessive amounts of soy on almost anything Chinese if you go to a restaurant at least, and that's why you just taught me something new. Well, the funny thing, the funny thing about the Chinese is they don't really eat a lot of soy. It's it's an American thing, I think. Um, but if you go to China, they don't do that. And when I talk to the Chinese, they say they don't do that. Well, I'm I'm kind of reaching out to the everyday Americans, and for the everyday Americans, if you go to a Chinese restaurant, it's loaded with soy. And there's some Chinese restaurants where I don't even have options to eat because they don't have anything made without. Soy uh, sauce. 
Well, I was talking about cooking at home. Yeah, I was talking about cooking. Right, at but home. I guess what I'm saying is, uh, there people could there could be other people with that confusion because of the way that restaurants trend in the U.S. You see what I mean? So I was trying to give the the confused the the big question I, 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 and then entering it with clarity from your from your response. Well, if you go to a restaurant, you can just tell them you don't want soy sauce. That's what I do. Well, well, you can say that, but I, what, also what I said was that there are some restaurants, and I live in the Houston area. You probably know how big that is to wonder why there are restaurants like the ones I've been to that do not make anything without soy sauce, as, as far as which is why I generally don't don't advise. Is, um, Chinese food because there are a lot of Chinese restaurants have told me they they can't make anything without soy sauce. Yeah. It wasn't advice, it's just an idea. Yeah. Well, it's, a, it's still a topping that that's then again goes to the soy allergy that I often cannot eat Chinese because of it not being made without soy. But that's but I want listeners to hear what they make experience that I do, and in your clarification, and that that doesn't mean that they can't, can't eat Chinese food made at home uh, by just simply not putting the soy sauce on, but otherwise using um, did you call it Cajun seasoning or Chinese seasoning? Did you did you call it Chinese seasoning or what do you call it seasoning that the Chinese use? Oh, here's DJ Jeff. Hey DJ. Hi, so sorry about that. It didn't populate my calendar interesting uh, emily is um um she must have stepped away I her name. she stepped away she's still, on, she's still on zoom but she has her mic open so she must be doing something else oh okay well, well we were just talking about um uh, food options for people with gluten soy milk and egg out oh geez and um I can't remember her name now. I'm so sorry, but the, the lady I was just speaking with that's that's in the background. Uh, she's she was talking to uh, she was talking to us about um how you can make Chinese food at home and it be soy free. And I found that interesting because I was telling her how it, you know. And in this show, it's about people like myself with those four allergens, gluten, soy, milk, and egg. And at least locally in the Houston area, I can't really go to any any Chinese restaurant without them having soy sauce on it. On all of the dishes, and they're like, I'm sorry, we can't make anything free of that. I'm sorry, we can't serve you. Yeah. And then she was talking about how- I find the same thing. You can... Okay, so that's not just me. Nope. <laughs> she was talking about how we can make the Chinese food at home and leave off soy because you're saying about some kind of Chinese seasoning doesn't involve soy and it's only the sauce. Yeah, so that's where we list of the dark sauces that they use to make Chinese food um, either have soy or they have gluten. So you would either have to go with like um, an oyster. Oyster um, sauce or something similar. Okay, so to so see, I was okay. So what she was telling us was that it's soy free, but you're saying that the Chinese seasoning has gluten. Most of it does, yeah. So if you're if you're celiac, like 
the processed Chinese food is not something that you can do. But yes, if you make it at home from scratch, you can. But who has the time to do that? I don't know. I don't. <laughs> I was wondering, but she was saying that if we make Chinese food at home, we can eat it without having gluten, soy milk, or egg. And I was thinking, let's say stir fry because you you got the, um, I mean, it wouldn't be always stir fry because you wouldn't have the soy sauce, but you've got the gluten free and, and other allergen free of rice. And then you've got the different meat, like if, say, if you do really fine chopped uh, uh, pork or some other meat, and then you've got the different vegetables you put in like broccoli, carrots, whatever other vegetables, like in that case, stir fry, but some people may consider that more of a, a Japanese than a Chinese. But if you just leave off the soy sauce, then at least the way I know how to make it, it is allergen free. Well, in, in some, there are some, uh, what is it, tamari, which tastes similar to soy sauce that doesn't have gluten, but I don't know if it has soy. Well, there's actually a, 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 um, you know what, if you want to give, give some tips, I'll be right back with this sauce I have that's soy-free soy sauce. Like, it has the flavor, but it doesn't have the actual allergen. Oh, that's cool. That's cool. Well, you talk um, about I'm, some tips? I'm fairly, I was going to say, I'm fairly new to having to be completely gluten-free because of celiac. Um, and right. I have been mostly disappointed <laughs> especially if, with, if you're going out to eat it gets so difficult because like you can go into a restaurant and they'll say well we can do anything gluten-free just let us know what you want but if they're still cooking it in the same kitchen you're going to have cross-contamination so if you're soy intolerant meaning that you know it bothers you but it's not an allergy which physically affects you most of the time you'll be fine however the more you expose yourself to that allergen the more severe your reaction is going to become and uh i've and i've had that issue recently where i almost ended up in the hospital it was such a bad cross-contamination so you know unfortunately the onus is on us as the, the people that have that allergy to do our due diligence before we go. Um, I, I typically have it so that I just don't, I, I'll eat before I go to a restaurant. <laughs> I'll eat at home, go to the restaurant. If they have something that I can eat, then, you know, great. And if not, no worries. I watch everybody else enjoy their food. Um, but those restaurants that truly take allergies seriously and have like a separate kitchen the chef has to change their jacket gloves everything hairnet before walking into the kitchen and when they walk out changing back again that's the kind of restaurant that you want to be supporting but know that your your food's going to take longer than anybody else's and um so either ask them to make sure that you know, your gluten-free meal is coming out at the same time, which is going to hold everybody else up. But you, you really need to understand that they thoroughly clean between every gluten-free meal they prepare. And a separate server will, re will bring that out to you. And I really appreciate going to restaurants like that, even though it may take 45 minutes for me to get my, my meal and everybody else is finishing. They're right. not going to to the hospital. They really care about my health. So I I make sure and that... They can agree. You said they end up in the emergency room for the slightest exposure. That's also, in a way, taking care of your health and your life. Exactly. Because like, especially those that have anaphylaxis, if I say it right. Yeah. Because yeah. like mine, I was tested, and mine's not celiac disease or any of that kind of stuff, but m my primary care was really quick to to test me for that when he heard about my gluten allergy, but I don't have those, but um, mine is a digestive reaction. 
action that can have me, you know, only going back there once every three weeks if I eat it regularly. So in that case, it's as far as it's coming up and ended up really sick and ill, it is serious. But like, um, if I just have a small amount for, say, just dessert or just one meal and be only one day for every week, then I have a reaction, but I can take medicine that treats the reaction. But like, if I have that reaction to every single meal, then do you see what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's when it turns into an allergy rather than just being intolerant. And, and well, my mom's, my mom's intolerant and she, my mom's a registered nurse, but my doctor says it's an allergy and my mom's like, oh no, it's not an allergy or you'd be having sinus and these kind of reactions versus the digestive kind. I'm like, no, that's not true. Different people react different, mom. Yeah. Yeah. She's thinking of allergies, like seasonal allergy kind of stuff. You can have an allergy. Exactly. Like I can't, I can't have, um. What's the, what's the antibiotic that everybody prescribes? Um, penicillin. You give me penicillin, I stop breathing. That's an allergy. That's an allergic reaction. See, penicillin is what caused my epilepsy. See, that's why I'm considered one of the worst 30 cases in the country of epilepsy. And it was caused by penicillin in my DTP shot. That's crazy. So I've no, I, I don't really know life without epilepsy and without being so severe that I'm considered disabled and so forth because I can't even regularly show up for whatever are my uh, obligations, you know, as far as what, whatever kind of work I do. But um, it's, it's because I was exposed to penicillin and my DTP shot. And that's what caused what they, what they define as being progressively worsening with age epilepsy. So um, I was having anywhere from one to 10 to even 15 seizures a day before I ended up at the point of brain surgery after I failed all other treatments, so every medication on the market, all other surgeries. And finally they came to a point, they just had to rip out a piece of my brain. That's terrible. And now well, I ended up and I think that the, 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 the onus really is on, each of us individually to stand up for ourselves and, and, you know, learn about those things that are right for us versus those things that are not right for us. And just not taking, you know, a physician's word at face value because, and not always to their detriment. I mean, they are, they are making analysis and, and, um, diagnosis based on the information that you gave them. So oftentimes we'll walk in and maybe it's only one piece of the equation that really bothers us. And that's what we share. And we don't share everything else because we don't think that it's important. Yet if we told them that in addition to getting completely bloated, having pains worse than childbirth um, and having it, you know, give you, cause you such a severe headache, you might think that, well, the severe headache isn't part of that. So I'm only going to talk about the bloating and the, and the abdominal pain and anything that's due to that. And based on that, they're going to make, they're going to go down a certain path. But if you told them, I also have these massive migraine like headaches that come on at the same time. And as soon as all the other symptoms go away, the headache goes away too. They may say, oh my God, it's totally not what I was just talking about. It's this, because that's a key piece of- You raised an interesting <laughs> point. I also, I also have migraines. So because of my migraines and epilepsy, I have to avoid other things. They're not allergens, but are things I can't tolerate. Like, um, uh, they used to call these, call it aspartame, but I don't even say the new word. Phenol something. Oh yeah, I don't I don't know. Like Coca Coca-Cola Zero or Coke Zero, whatever they call it. It's P A G E and something, but that's a modern day word for aspartame. Oh, Just like it before it was called NutraSweet. Yep. So anyways, that's a modern day word for aspartame. And like aspartame is one thing that will onset my um seizures, but it also onsets my um, migraines 
and other things like that that's where they don't consider an allergy because of like what we were talking about, where reactions, but it's still something I can't have. So I totally understand. Mm. And uh, I hate to say this, but we're at 50 minutes. So we need to um, start doing our closing. Would you be willing to uh, share your name, any contact information for people interested in um, possibly connecting with you? Because I think you said you're a dietitian, right? No, I'm not a dietitian. I I am a, a host of a podcast called Advantages to Aging. I'm also a founding brand partner with Neora, which okay. is all kit based age defying skincare, hair care, wellness, and weight management. And I just happen to be gluten intolerant or have a gluten allergy. Okay, well, definitely you're a great source for this, this show, then. And we'd love to have you on for another Monday. Um, but if people are interested in learning about you and what you do, um, will you share your name and information where they can reach you? Um, sure. Is there a place you want me to share it or just verbally? <laughs> yes. Uh, I'm TJ. It's TJ Horton. Uh, you can reach me through my website, Advantages to Aging, A D V A N T A G E S T O A G I N G dot com. <laughs> <laughs> it's not the number two, it's a T-O, Advantages to Aging. And the podcast can be heard on most channels as well. And that's the best way to get a hold of me. Okay, well, thank you. Well, we'd love for you to book, book to be on our, um, to use our Calendly and to be on our show again, talking about gluten, gluten stuff again. Uh, and same to um, the lady in the background that's on um, a building now, Zoom, Emily, if she can still hear us. No, she's gone. Oh, she's gone. Okay. Well, Emily, okay. just, just reach out to me and I'll, um, and I'll schedule. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Ms. Steven. Uh, Emily, do you or Kurt have any uh, announcements in our last few minutes? Uh, Not sure at the moment. Okay, then I'll go ahead and mine. I don't think of anything. I don't know. Sure. Uh, to all the viewers out there, uh, if you'd like to help raise funds for us to produce um, more audio books, more podcasts, and help support our, our uh, organization, please go to the, go to Facebook and look up in the group search. Jen's Books and More, 31 Fundraiser. That's J-E-N-N-S, Books, the and symbol, not the word, M-O-R-E, 31 Fundraiser. And it will say April 1st through April 12th. And you have to first go to Facebook.com or your Facebook app, go under Groups, and then search for Jen's Books and More, 31 Fundraiser, which will say it. It's April 1st through 12th of 2023. Um, if you don't make it make it uh, in time, we will be ha having this again in October. But please go ahead and subscribe to that group so we can continue to bring you more um, podcasts, books, audiobooks, and so much more. Um, if you would like to be on this podcast or see what else we have to offer, please go to linktr.ee forward slash Jaws Coffee Chat. That's linktr.ee forward slash J A W S Coffee Chat. Uh, if you would like to join a women's Bible study, entrepreneur group, networking group, and so much more, Please go to aspirewomenforexcellence.com. That's A S P I R E women, F O R excellence.com. And that's a, the Bible study by Lady Kendra. That's where you'll also find me. It's where I go for doing my Bible studies, networking, and 
uh, other ways related to both uh, professionally and personally uh, bringing Christ into the way I do business, the way I run my life in general, even in personal life, and so much more. Um, though we do not require anybody to be of any certain faith to watch our podcast. Um, and if you'd like to see what all we have to offer, please go to our website, books and more by Jennifer A. Whitaker.com. Books A N D M O R E by Jennifer A. W H I T T A K E R.com. And that's our website where you'll find more about our podcast as well as um, books and other things we have to bring to the table and to offer. And wherever you found us to listen or, or watch this, please. Be sure to subscribe on your favorite podcast app to Jaws Coffee Chat, J-A-W-S Coffee Chat. And that's our our podcast channel for this episode and other episodes of uh, Jaws Diet and other shows we bring you. Back to you, Emily. Uh, you can also contact us through jawscoffeechat at gmail.com uh, for any questions, comments, concerns, and so on uh, through jawscoffeechat at gmail.com. Um, we are here every Monday at 9 a.m. Uh, Central Time. I encourage everybody to join us when, or tune in whenever your schedule allows. Um, again, uh, thanks to Marcus Hart of Transforming Media, Jay Stoyan of the Disability Channel, Zach Clayton of the PAC Channel, and Lawrence Wingate of Wingate Studios for allowing us to have this on their platform. And so on behalf of Jen, John, Kurt, myself, and the rest of the World of Mobility Podcast Network, uh, we... Wish you a safe and productive week and to stay happy.